Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last of this year's Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum Autumn Science Lectures, sponsored by Plants People Planet. Um, if you don't already know, my name is Simon Hiscock, and I'm the director of the Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And it will be my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, but only after some preliminary housekeeping information. Um, first of all, this lecture is being recorded, but your camera and mic are turned off, so you're not being recorded. Uh, if you would like to ask a question to the speaker, then please do use the Q&A function, and you can do that at any time, um, and I will put the questions to the speaker at the end of, of the talk. If you need to contact us about anything else, for instance, any technical problems, just use the chat function and one of the team will, will get back to you um, as quickly as possible. And the recording will be available for attendees after the event and we'll be sharing details of how to get that um, via the email that you use to register for the lecture. So now, it is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Yadvinder Marley, Professor of Ecosystem Science at the Environmental Change Institute within the School of Geography and the Environment here at Oxford. He is also director of the recently established Leverhulme Centre for Nature Recovery an Oxford-based hub for innovative thinking, discussion, and analysis of nature recovery, uh, both nationally and worldwide. Yadvinder's extensive research portfolio seeks to understand the impact of global change on the ecology, structure, and composition of terrestrial ecosystems, and in particular, temperate and tropical forests. To do this, he and his team use a range of techniques, including large-scale long-term ecological monitoring and satellite remote sensing to deliver outputs of direct relevance for conservation and adaptation to climate change. This world-leading research has taken them to forests all over the world, including Amazonia, Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, and closer to home, Whiteham Woods. Yadvinder's achievements in research have been recognized in numerous ways, including Fellowship of the Royal Society, the Royal Geographical Society's Patrons Medal, and the Marsh Award for Climate Change, of the British Ecological Society, the science society that um, Yadvinder is currently president of. In the Queen's 2020 birthday honours list, Yadvinder was awarded a CBE. So now, moving on to tonight's lecture, the title of Yadvinder's lecture is Tropical Rainforest, Tropical Forests, and planet Earth, an overview. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Yadvinda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you all uh, this, this evening. I'll just get my slides up. Okay, so I, pre I presume you can see my slides. Slides okay? Yeah, all good. Great. Uh, yes, th thank you for that introduction. And tonight on this on this cold, dark, near winter night, I'm going to take you to the to the lush green tropical forest biome, which is somewhere that I've spent much of my career working and. Uh, my my research uh, it's it's based it's based in ecology, but also it combines ecology with earth system sciences, with understanding the planet Earth and its functioning as a whole. And what I'm going to describe to you today 
is a little bit of my perspective and my journey in trying to combine intimate local ecology with understanding the functioning of, of, our, of our planet. And uh, there are many reasons why I, I study tropical forests. I love working in tropical forests. They're, uh, the richness of biodiversity, uh, their importance for planetary function. Uh, but I think the fundamental underlying reason is I simply love tropical field work. I love being out in a tropical rainforest and uh, uh, gazing both up. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is uh, on a night camping out in the forest is to have a, maybe a glass of whiskey and gaze out at the stars above and the spatial infinity of, of the universe, but also gaze around at the vegetation and the biodiversity around me and at the biological infinity of, of, of the living world and of the tropical forest biome in particular with millions of species. And as you sit there gazing out, wondering which of those insects that's flying around you is still undescribed to science, which, are, which processes do we still not understand? So it's this sense of the infinity of the tropical forest is it, uh, in terms of biological terms, that's part of their, their appeal. Uh, I, as you may have guessed uh, from my gazing at the stars, I'm a bit of a science fiction fan. And uh, you can see in science fiction, many portrayals of exotic alien worlds. This, this is from uh, 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 the film Avatar, where you have these supersized trees that are homes to these indigenous peoples living on these, on these far off planets. Uh, but I would argue that when it comes to, when you look at things with the right eyes, you don't need to imagine far off worlds to see worlds of wonder and miracle. You can go into almost any biome, but I would say particularly into a tropical forest biome. And there is as much mystery and as much wonder in these forests as there is in the most vivid imaginations of our best science fiction writers. And these forests uh, matter not only because of their biological richness, because, but because they play such an important role in planetary function. And if you look at uh, any, any image of the Earth, you can see often the, the great tropical areas uh, uh, splayed out, girdling the equator. And often you can get a hint of the importance that they play in global atmospheric circulation and weather. So, so in this image, you can see the, the deep convection occurring over the mass of the the lush wet Amazon basin, and that ends up triggering cascades of weather and change across the entire planet, and also has a major role in the biological functioning of the planet. And one way to understand that uh, uh, biological functioning is to go away from this conventional imaging and mapping and to look at things uh, with other axes. And one of the advantages of being in the geography department is that I'm often surrounded by colleagues who think a lot about maps and different ways of mapping data. And this is work that was done with my colleague Ben Hennig, now at Reykjavik, who worked a lot with cartograms, which are often used for economic data, where, and, and then in this map here, the size of a pixel uh, is not only area, but represents a magnitude of photosynthesis or the biological metabolism of that pixel of land surface. So, so areas that are highly productive biologically are expanded, and areas such as the Sahara or Greenland that have very little biological productivity shrivel away to, to, to almost nothing. So in January, and we're not very far off from January now, uh, this is a, a biological view of the Earth's land surface. And you see that Biologically, in, the, in, in, in around January time, we are living on a tropical planet. That's where almost all of the biological activity on the land surface, at least, uh, is occurring. And the largest countries in the world are countries like Brazil and the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and, and Indonesia. Uh, if we go, go through to July, you've had the great greening of the Northern Hemisphere, and you see something that looks a little bit more familiar in terms of the shapes of the continents, although still distorted. You see the Sahara it has disappeared uh, in this image. And we can do this sort of calculation for every month of the year using satellite data and get a sense of the, the shifting, the seasonal shift of the relative importance of the tropical biome in, in terms of planetary metabolism, planetary function. And this is this great green heartbeat that, that powers much of life on Earth, the, 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 the pulse of photosynthesis is what ultimately cascades through ecosystems and powers the biodiversity of life, life on, on the land surface. 
And as I mentioned at the start, my own work particularly focuses on trying to relate the detailed ecology of tropical forests to their planetary function. And uh, plan the, the study of planetary function in all its forms is a, is a realm of science that's often now known as Earth system science, which examines the Earth as this integrated system, incorporating its physical and biological and chemo chemical and human uh, dimensions. And it's a relatively young science. It really uh, only kicked off in the 60s and 70s. And that's because uh, in, in, in the 60s and 70s, there was the development of new technologies that enabled this, this young science to, to develop. And new technologies often shape science. And so uh, here's, here's a lovely example from, from the 17th century. And this is one of the first microscopes uh, at, uh, in the world. And it was employed by Robert Hooke to examine various things uh, in close detail. This is the Micrographia, which was, which was this wonderful uh, title, Physical Descriptions of Minute Bodies Made by Magnifying Glasses with Observations and Inquiries Thereupon. Uh, I wish I could still write papers uh, with titles like that. Uh, and uh, uh, and so with, with this mi microscope, what uh, what Hook did was look at things that were mundane and ordinary, but beyond access to the human eye. So here's a, a famous image that he had had of, of a flea, and when you look at this at a level that's inaccessible previously to the human eye, you see the wonders of of the biological world, details that were uh, were not apparent earlier uh, uh, that become revealed. Uh, another example is when he looked at the bark of coke, uh, or, uh, cork oak and, uh, and, and saw this, this regular lattice-like structure in the bark and then proposed the idea that, that living organisms were built of uh, uh, smaller units, which, which were termed cells. And this, this simple observation through the technology ultimately led to the advent of cell theory, and uh, which became the basis of almost all of modern organismic uh, biology. And so new technologies can not only reveal new wonders, but they can also reveal new theories of the nature of the living world of life, life on Earth. Now, Earth system science has also been shaped by new technologies, but the technologies we need to understand the Earth uh, are ways of seeing that are normally inaccessible to, to, to average human vision. But rather than microscopes that dive in deep at the fine level, what's needed to understand the earth are macroscopes, things that give us a view of the earth much larger than our simple direct human vision uh, permits. And uh, there are a number of macroscopes involved. Uh, the, the first, uh, most perhaps most obvious one is earth observation, the use of satellite data now we have a whole constellations of satellites uh, observing the Earth and different wave bands and different different sensors uh, that enable us to visualize the planet as a whole and various functions. You see an example of a range of images here from ozone concentration to evaporation to, to gross primary production or, or evaporation stress. So we're, we're able to understand and view the Earth at, at these macroscopic scales that we need to understand uh, Earth functioning. But but simply viewing it would not be enough of a macroscope. And so the, the second macroscope, uh, which also arose in the 60s and 70s, is the uh, advent of computer simulations, uh, which have become increasingly sophisticated over time. I like this one. This, this one is simply a, a climate simulation that shows the movement of uh, water vapor moisture uh, in the atmosphere. And again, if you look at this, you can see both the pulsing as the sun moves over the, the different tropical basins, the Congo and then the Amazon, and, and then the moisture that's pushed up by, by vegetation into the atmosphere and then circulates out to, to, to higher latitudes. Again, giving a hint of the importance of this tropical metabolism and ultimately shaping uh, the functioning of our entire planet. And uh, so models have developed uh, and become increasingly sophisticated over time, but they face one fundamental challenge that any model that we have is always an approximation of the complexity of a real biological system. So here's an image of a, a forest in the Peruvian Andes, and we can look at this and see its complexity in a variety of ways. The, the variety of species there, the variety of animal-plant interactions, the, the soil interactions, the fungi, uh, 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 
a whole range of processes, the microclimate in this in the system. And the challenge uh, for any model is no model is ever good enough to completely capture the complexity of a system. And there, here's one example of a relatively state-of-the-art global vegetation model. I won't go into the details of the processes, but on the left, you can see this model tries to capture photosynthesis and metabolism of the plants, the water budgets, water coming up from the soil. And on the right, it starts looking at the dynamics of populations of plants, the uh, allocation, mortality, recruitment, uh, disturbance, and, and tries to capture key elements of, 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 of a, any particular uh, uh, pixel of, of, of an ecosystem. But the challenge always is, how do we get enough complexity to answer the questions that interest us for the particular at that moment, while not making a model so unnecessarily complex that it becomes unwieldy, that we get lost in its complexity and fail to understand the organizing principles of, uh, that, that help us answer the questions we're asking. Uh, we're asking. And there's, the, the, that balance is different for the, depending on the question you're asking, but it's a constant tension between modeling and observation. And, uh, and so the, this key challenge we have is how do we relate earth system processes to local ecological complexity? And, and, this, and we need to answer this question of how, for, our quest, for any particular question that we're asking, how much complexity is necessary and sufficient? And so this is where I want to introduce uh, much of what our, my own research has focused on, which are, uh, I, I would term the is the third macroscope. And this is one that's very different in nature from the other two. It's not embedded in advanced state of the art technologies. It's distributed ground observation networks where we try and observe a local ecological detail in detail, but also in a standardized methodology that spans large areas overall. And then gives a, enables us to combine an, an understanding of ecological richness with the scale required for this to be a, a macroscope. And so this third macroscope, these, these global observation networks, uh, have some key features. They're rich in understanding of ecological process and mechanism, so they enable that, that bridge between ecology and earth system science to be established. They're more distributed, they're less centralized. It isn't just one satellite or one supercomputer doing all this work. It's, it's a range of researchers working out in, in different forests and other, other systems collecting these data. It's much less funded. All, I haven't got the numbers at hand, but if you think of all the money gone into global ecological observation on the ground and compare that to the price of one state-of-the-art satellite, it, 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 there's much less funding that, that goes into these observation networks. But it also it is technology powered. It's the dig digital connectivity of the modern age that enables us to work in real time with colleagues in the Amazon or the Congo, share data, uh, work together on designing protocols and, and, and producing outputs. But another feature of this microscope is that it engages with one of the fundamental challenges in, in global ecological science, which is the in inequity in the practice of ecology, where much of the ecological richness of the planet is found in the global south, in the tropics in particular, and yet much of the resources available for research are in the global north, in Europe and North America and Japan and a few other countries. And so uh, to make these networks work, we can't simply have resources locked away in, 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 in Europe and North America. Those resources have to be shared in an equitable way, and the work has to be shared in an equitable way with partners in tropical countries, which host uh, the, the biological richness that we're interested in. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of a, a few networks. One that uh, I've been involved in uh, since his early days is, is this Forest Plots Network, which is a network of one hectare plots uh, that look at changing dynamics over time in tropical forests, the, the, the nature of the tropical forest carbon sink, uh, a feature of the biogeography of, of, of tropical uh, vegetation. And this, this has uh, yielded many, uh, many interesting uh, publications and results. Another quite well-known one is the Forest Geo Network that's run by the Smithsonian Institute. And that is a much larger design of typically 50 hectare plots where every tree above one centimeter diameter is measured. And that's particularly well designed for looking at questions of spatial interaction uh, spatial ecology on, on the scale of 50 hectares, how trees interact with each other, how that affects uh, 
diversity and recruitment and the creation of biodiversity in forests. And th this network was initially focused on the tropics, but in recent decades, it's also become a temperate network and our own Whiteham Woods is a, is a key uh, site in, 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 the, in this global net network. Uh, uh, but the one I'm going to focus on is one that we created in the early 2000s, uh, which is termed the Global Ecosystems Monitoring Network. And we have a, pro a protocol that's available and uh, and shared uh, uh, quite widely uh, uh, amongst partners uh, and uh, any anybody interested in, in this protocol. So what the GEM protocol uh, seeks to do is to adopt an ecosystems ecology approach to, to to these networks, fo focusing on uh, quantifying flows of carbon or energy or nutrients uh, and uh, relating these to earth system science. And the advantage on focusing on these flows is that it's speaking the same language as these earth system science models. What these models try and do is look at flows of water or nutrients or energy uh, uh, and, and scale them to a larger scale. And by working at the local scale and trying to quantify those flows, uh, the ecosystem ecology enables us to, to link ecological detail and you speak the same language that enables us to connect across to, to, the, to the planetary macroscopes. And so just to give you a quick overview of some of the key processes of, of carbon, or you, can, or you can think about this in terms of energy, energy and carbon are very equivalent in, in, in biological terms. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you think of a forest, firstly, any, any, well, any ecosystem, any terrestrial ecosystem takes up uh, uh, energy or carbon through through photosynthesis. This is often termed the gross primary production or GPP. Uh, a fairly large amount of that energy that's taken up is used by the plants themselves in their own metabolism. Typically about 70% of their photosynthesis ends up being used in their own uh, plant metabolism or plant respiration, re resulting in the release of carbon from the plants themselves. Uh, the rest is used to build biomass in, in, in the plants, and that can be either in leaves or flowers or fruit, it can be in wood, or it can be in fine roots. This is often termed the, the net primary productivity, or NPP. Uh, and all of that biomass will eventually end up as dead biomass, either when the plants die, or when seasonally the plants shed their leaves or, or, or their fine roots. And that, that, and that dead material is then primarily uh, consumed by microbes, by fungi and bacteria uh, uh, for energy. And that releases the CO2 back to the atmosphere in the form of a heterotrophic respiration. A small amount of that living biomass, uh, however, is consumed uh, by uh, higher tro trophic levels uh, by herbivores or, or detritivores in the case of dead material. And then a, a, a fraction of that is then consumed uh, at, at even higher trophic levels uh, through through predation, and so what the gem network tries to do is particularly focuses focuses on that on that uh, the plant and microbial part of this this diagram. But towards the end of my talk, I'll talk about some of the new work we're doing is also linking it to the animal part of this diagram as well through herb herbivory and predation. This is another way of thinking through this uh, the, the chain of connection and causality that the, our data sets try and do of looking at photosynthesis. What fraction of that is used in plant respiration? How much that produces biomass as net primary production? What fraction of that biomass ends up in wood? And how much of that wood sticks around the lifetime of trees uh, and ends up determining the standing biomass of, of, of that ecosystem? Uh, and to, to, to measure the, these terms, we use a range of uh, equipment. Uh, we measure growth with precision dendrometers. Uh, we measure canopy production through litter fall traps that every two weeks collect leaves and flowers and fruit. Uh, uh, we measure below ground production through ingrowth cores where we put in mesh of root free soil and come back three months later and see how the fine roots have grown into that mesh and quantify the below ground productivity. Uh, we do similar, we do measurement of the, 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 the metabolism of the microbes in the soil through uh, by measuring the flow of CO2 out of the soil and separating out the soil into root-free, uh, litter-free and soil components to try and understand which, where, the, where the metabolism is, is occurring in the soil. 
We do similar measurements on the stems of trees to understand the woody metabolism of plants and on the leaves of trees to measure the respiration and photosynthesis uh, of plants. And we couple this with climate data uh, that enables us to translate these observations to, to larger temporal and spatial scales. And this is an example of the types of measurements uh, we, we do. We show, I won't go into detail here, this is for an Amazonian forest in, in, in Peru, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in southeastern Peru. And you see the types of data we have. We've filled that diagram that I showed in the previous diagram with numbers. And uh, there are very, they're many interesting features, but one thing I'll just uh, point out is uh, the woody production of a forest is around 2.6 uh, megagrams of carbon. And that's compared to the, uh, the, the, the photosynthesis is around 36 megagrams. So less than 10% of the photosynthesis of a forest ends up producing the woody biomass, which is the, the long lived carbon storage, the, the most prominent part of a forest. So much more uh, of that photosynthesis is used in all these detailed processes of allocation and metabolism throughout, throughout the ecosystem. And what we try and do in our network is, is try and quantify some of those processes. Uh, coupled with that, we do a range of measurements of canopy properties, of leaf traits, spectral reflectivity, ecophysiological measurements that, that we can couple with, with, with these, these measurements. And this is a map of our, our global distribution of plots. The colors indicate different types of measurements that we have there. But you see that we have quite a dense spread. We initially started in South America and the Amazon and the Andes. Over the last decade, I've done a lot of work in Africa and expanding the network there, and also some spots in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, as well as a few temperate sites, such as the, the temperate rainforests of Chile, uh, have been a particular focus. Uh, so just to highlight some of the examples of the sites in Ghana, we have a wonderful gradient from rainforest to savanna uh, over, this, uh, over this transition in West Africa. In Gabon, we work in sites that are rich in megafauna and elephants and gorillas and compare them to that site with sites that are depleted in the, in the megafauna. Uh, in Peru, uh, we have an elevation gradient going from the lowland Amazon forest up to three and a half thousand meters up in the cloud forest to try and understand the role of elevation and temperature on ecosystem functioning. In Brazil, uh, we have a logging gradient of intensity of logging and fire disturbance compared to old growth forests. In Malaysia, uh, we have a logging gradient as well that I'll describe it in a bit more de detail later on. And in Australia, we have an elevation gradient okay, similar to the one in Peru. Uh, and one key element of this work is that all of this work, it can't be done without long term partnerships with local colleagues. That, so when we develop relationships, we're in there for the long term. And in ecology and in international ecology, there's been a lot of debate and criticism in the last few years of the paradigms of parachute science or helicopter science. These models that a lot of science did, particularly in the 60s and 70s and earlier on of well funded northern institutions going on expeditions to the south and spending a week or two uh, having an adventure, collecting some samples and coming back and not developing long-term relationships, not investing in the in the future of the, of the partners in those countries. And so the GEM is a very conscious example of trying to push and beyond this paradigm into something that's about meaningful collaborations that last for years and decades and support uh, tropical researchers in developing capacity and ability to, to, to play equally on, in, on the global uh, scientific field. And there are deep global inequities in, in ecology. As I mentioned earlier, tropicals dominate the biosphere, but there's resources are in the north, the huge structural burdens for tropical researchers. Language dominance by English doesn't help very much either. And a publishing system, particularly with open access, that is actually proving quite punishing for, for global south researchers to be able to afford to, to, to publish. As just some examples of some of the workshops that we run in the network. This was at our Andean transect in Peru at its 10th anniversary. Uh, most of our work, as I said earlier on, had been in South America. Uh, in 2016 in Gabon, we had a workshop where we finally got together our uh, uh, several years of working in Gabon. And there's those six bars you see in the center of this diagram were the first ever data from, from African forests, from these forests in Gabon. On the left is the Amazon, on the right is uh, Southeast Asian forests. So that was a this was Africa's first step into the into these data sets. A few months later, our Ghanaian colleagues didn't want to be left behind. And so we had a workshop in Ghana with a similar effect. And then suddenly you see we had more data from Africa than from South America and Southeast Asia, which have traditionally been 
where much, much, much more of this tropical forest research has been fo focused. Uh, and now I'll quickly run through some examples of our of our key findings and results, uh, looking at different elements of, of this chain from production to, to biomass that, that, that you see here. Uh, so one thing we look at is this photosynthesis. How does photosynthesis vary uh, between sites uh, uh, across the tropics? And, and here's work by my student Huanyan uh, Zhang Zheng uh, that's currently in, uh, in press, where we look at productivity uh, in, the, uh, uh, in West African forest in, in blue, going from a wet to dry gradient, a rainforest on the left to dry forest on the right, and in Amazonian forests. And, and the, the work in Amazonia was published slightly earlier, and we saw this nice gradient of decreasing productivity with increasing dryness that we suggested might be a general pattern across the tropics. But when we worked in West Africa, we firstly, we found that that pattern didn't hold there, but also we found extraordinary product productivity in these moderately dry forests in, in West Africa. And these are the highest productivities we've measured anywhere in the tropics. And we still don't know why West Africa is, is so productive. Uh, my favorite hypothesis for this that still needs to be proved and tested is that it's to do with the intense deposition of dust from the Sahara that falls into the West African forests every year, the inches of dust that's uh, dried up lake beds from, from the early Holocene. And this dust is rich in phosphorus and calcium and ends up fertilizing and liming these forests. And that may be contributing to this extraordinarily high, high productivity that we're me measuring. But what this figure shows us, whether that hypothesis is correct or incorrect, what this figure shows us is that tropical forests are not the same everywhere. There's a distinct by biogeographical or other patterns that shape their, their, their productivity. The next thing we can look at is how this net primary productivity is partitioned between woods and between flowers and fruit and roots. And here's a diagram showing this partitioning. This is a ternary diagram, which, uh, which shows for any one plot, if most of its productivity goes into roots, the site will be down here on the left. If most of its productivity goes to the stem, the, the, the plot would point would be near the top. And if it's to, to the canopy, the point is to the bottom right. And what you see is broadly, there's a spread of data in the middle. There is an interesting pattern that the Asian forests in blue are towards the right. They don't invest much in root productivity. And I think what's going on there is that the Asian forests are do dominated by one tree family, the Diptrocarpaceae, who have, which have ectomycorrhizal ectomycorrhizal associations with their roots. And I suspect they don't invest so much in growing their roots because they're investing in feeding resources into their, into their fungal associations. And that shows that there's a really interesting biogeographical story to be told that Asian forests, at least diptocarp dominated forests are very different in how they invest in their roots and below ground compared to, compared to other tropical forests. But if we plot those data against uh, various environmental variables, one interesting thing we also see is that where sites are sandier or more yellow in this diagram, they invest more in fine roots. So if you're trying to predict and uh, generally understand the pattern of investment in roots in forests, it seems like soil texture and sandiness is a key variable. Uh, so going beyond the, uh, uh, the, the, the particular field sites, uh, the one thing we want to do is then to, to try and relate this to planetary function to the other macroscopes we need to go from these local scales to these global scales and link the ecology to the remote sensing. And uh, one way we do that is by examining our plots, uh, collecting features of the plots, uh, and, uh, and then scaling through remote sensing. And this is an image of one of our sites collected by my colleague Jesus Aguay Gutierrez. This is in Ancasa in Ghana in West Africa. And this is an image if you looked at this with your eyes, you would see different shades of green la largely, but this is a multispectral image that looks at many more bands, both in the visible and in the near infrared. And by having those extra bands, we, we have extra power to our eyes essentially. And what you're seeing here in these different colors are the different chemistries and morphologies and physiologies of the different species in the forest. Some may be rich in phosphorus, some may have fire for photosynthetic capacity, some may be richer in nitrogen. And we can start picking apart the apparent uniform greenness of a tropical forest once we use multispectral images. And we also use drones, as shown here, to collect this imagery at finer scale. Uh, 
And then we combine that with our sampling of individual leaves in, in, in the canopies, which we locate in the wider grid. And then we can predict the properties of other, other leaves in our, in our plot. And then we can combine that with satellite data, particularly the Sentinel satellite for freely available satellite data that again, looks at multiple spectral bands beyond the visible on the left in this diagram into the near infrared onto the shortwave infrared. And once we do that, we can, we can scale from our plot level measurements to, uh, through the satellites to the plant, to the planetary scale. And this is work that's currently uh, in review, but what we're seeing here are the first pantropical maps of properties such as leaf thickness, looking at how leaf thickness varies across the Amazon basin and the Congo and Southeast Asia. And at the bottom, plant wood density. We see much higher wood density in the Eastern Amazon, lower in these younger soils in the Western Amazon on the base of the Andes, much lower in these more recent systems in, in much of, of, of younger soils in much of Southeast Asia. So we can start for the first time seeing the detailed patterns of the biogeography of tropical uh, forest function. And seeing that tropical forests aren't some uniform mass of green, they're rich in detail and texture once we have the right eyes and the right tools to, to, to understand them. Uh, so everything I've described thus far in my work has been about vegetation. And maybe that's appropriate because I'm talking to, uh, giving a botanical uh, gardens talk, but uh, when we think about the functioning of ecosystems, we can't just stop at the vegetation. Uh, there, there's there's much more that that uh, links uh, that the, the, the vegetation is is interacting with, and that is of course the animals, the fungi, and the many other components. So what I'm going to describe for the next few minutes is one of our early forays of how we can bring animal and ecosystem function into this the, the same framing that I've just used and therefore understand a little bit more about the role that animals play in planetary function, in earth system function. Uh, that, that isn't entirely determined by vegetation because animals also end up interacting and, and shaping that vegetation. So how? So the question I'm asking is how can we go from the vegetation productivity to this cascade to higher trophic levels? And uh, just to go back to this diagram, I showed you the uh, what I've described so far in terms of results has been mainly the vegetation carbon and energy cycle. And I want to focus on these two arrows on the left, how much of that captured energy ends up cascading through animals in an ecosystem. And the way we do this is by applying a lens of ecological energetics. Now, all of life, uh, almost all of life, apart from the, the chemiotrophic life, is powered by the capture of sunshine and the cascade of that captured sunshine through the different trophic levels of an ecosystem. And so it, I like to work with energy because uh, it's a physically meaningful unit. It means something real in the world. It's not a metric that we just made up to describe a system. And in physics, it's often uh, the definition of energy is the ability to do work. So the more energy that flows through a species or a or a ecosystem, uh, uh, ecosystem type, the more the work is going on in that system in, in terms of its, its, its functioning. And there's a long history in, in, in ecology, but relatively, until uh, recently, it's been relatively neglected. So how do we calculate the energy uptake by animals? Ideally, we'd watch every animal and what it consumes and uh, calculate from that, but that, that's clearly impossible. So the way we do this is by using uh, scaling approaches. So there's quite a well-established relationship between the energy requirements of an animal and the mass of the animal. So the larger the animal, the more energy it requires, but it isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. It's, it's actually significantly less than a one-to-one -one relationship as larger animals have, lower, have slower metabolisms than, than, than smaller animals. But, it, but what we can do is, is, therefore, if we know the mass of an animal, we can estimate how much one individual animal needs in terms of energy. And if we know the population densities of those animals, we can say what that entire species is requiring in terms of energy. And the work I'm going to describe is in the context of the, the, our sites in Southeast Asia, in Borneo, some of the most magnificent old growth forests on Earth. Uh, the, the, this is the Maliao uh, forest in, in Sabah, in Borneo, magnificent 50, 60 meter tall trees all around us. So you know, really, truly magnificent forests. But many of these forests in, in, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere are, are logged and uh, uh, heavily logged in the, in the case of many sites in Malaysia. 
in particular, with repeated rounds of logging. And these forests are often termed degraded tropical forests. And degradation can be a, a, a mixed blessing to be labeled degraded. On one level, degradation could encourage an, a re, efforts to conserve or restore those ecosystems so they, they're less degraded over time. But what, what often happens in practice is degraded is synonymous with ruined or of lesser value. And therefore conservation efforts focus on old growth systems and treat log systems are somehow of lesser value, less pristine, less virgin. You can use different terms like that. Uh, and therefore, perhaps more OK to convert into agriculture and other things, as long as we protect the, the really magnificent, pristine forests. So I wanted to question some of this idea of degraded systems, what ecological de degradation actually means. If you look at these forests in terms of biomass, they clearly are uh, degraded in terms of biomass and function. These are LIDAR, these are airborne laser scans of these forests. And on the left, we've got these old growth forests in Malaysia. As I said, a magnificent forest, 60 meters tall as a mean canopy height. Uh, so uh, undoubtedly uh, structurally uh, magnificent forests. And these are the heavily logged forests at the same side. So they lost most of their biomass their the structure is down at 20 meters now in maximum height. So there's there's clearly a loss of carbon stocks or biomass if, if they're the things that interest us. But I wanted to understand a little bit more about the ecological function of these, these, these forests. Incidentally, while we were working in these forests uh, with our laser scans, uh, we uh, we were able to measure the heights of trees from, from the air, from, from the laser scans. And with our colleagues in Nottingham, we came across one particular high point uh, seemed an extraordinarily high tree. And then our colleague Unding, who you can see on the right there, climbed this tree and dropped down a measuring tape to measure its height. And it was 98, well, at the time we thought it was 100 meters, depending on, on the how you consider the base of the tree, uh, which makes it the tallest uh, tropical plant. Uh, we had then we had a bit of a to and fro with the Tasmanians about whether this was the tallest angiosperm, because the eucalyptus, the eucalypt trees in Tasmania are of similar magnitude, but they hadn't been directly measured. And then just last month, I was looking at the Guinness Book of Records and somebody had gone out and measured those, the tallest Tasmanian eucalypt, and it was about 97 meters. So this has uh, is now officially the world's tallest angiosperm, this, this lovely tree that, that we renamed Minara, which is Tower in, in Malay. Uh, but anyway, again, again, getting back to the, to the main focus. So what we had in this landscape is an dense array of uh, bird traps and mammal traps uh, collected by our colleagues at the University of Kent. So we had an amazing data on population densities for every bird species, for every mammal species in the old growth forest and in the logged forests, making this a unique data set that, that we could work on, on this question. And then using the protocol that I described before, we converted that to understand how much energy was flowing through the logged forest animals and birds compared to the old growth forests. And I'd expected before this doing this work that maybe the same amount of energy was flowing in the logged forest before it crashes in the oil palm. But to our surprise, we found two and a half times as much energy flowing through the birds and mammals in the logged forest than in the old uh, growth forest. There seemed to be much higher consumption of food, meaning there's much more food available in the logged forests. And when we looked at the different gills in the forest, we saw that because the size of the circle in this diagram is the amount of energy flowing through that particular guild. You can see the arboreal insectivores have really boomed, the omnivores in the trees have really boomed, as have the frugivores, terrestrial herbivores down here, uh, the, uh, the mammals have also greatly increased. But also th these S numbers are the number of species involved. And what you, know, what you could have imagined is just a few generalist species have taken over and and there's a decline in number of species. So even though there's more energy to be consumed, it isn't necessarily more, eco more ecological function if just a few species are taking over. But we see the species diversity maintained in the logged forest as well before it collapses in the oil palm plantation on the right. And when we look at which, of the, which species, as you go from the old growth forest to the, to the logged forest, we see actually most of the old growth forest species are doing well in the logged forest. There's a few species that significantly lose out at the bottom there. But the majority of species, this just shows the bottom 20 and the top 20, the majority of species on the right in red uh, uh, have, have, are doing better in the logged forest than in the old growth forest. And so what, what's going on here? Uh, 
what, uh, why does this logged forest have these amplified ecological energetics? And this is where it comes back to the plants. Uh, what we think is happening here is that the plant community is shifting to early successional. So an old growth forest is, is the site of chemical warfare. Most plants are prioritizing chemical defense against herbivory uh, as a way of maintaining themselves. So they're intensely chemically defended uh, and not very ed edible. When a disturbance goes through a forest or many other ecosystems, plants prioritize rapid growth after the disturbance to capture nutrients and capture light. They invest less in chemical defense. The forest becomes a lot more tasty to, to, to herbivores. And this boosts herbivore consumption, boosts population of insects, boosts the insectivores. There's more vegetation at the ground because light is penetrating the ground and that boosts the, the, the ground dwelling herbivores and omnivores. Uh, and so, uh, so, so what we're saying is that this, this forest here, this heavily logged forest, it may look quite degraded, but don't judge an ecosystem by its cover. In terms of ecological functioning, this system is as vibrant and perhaps even more vibrant than the old growth forest. And what we have to be careful with our messaging here, what we're not saying here is we should go ahead and log the remaining old growth forests. There's lots of reasons to protect them and admire them and, and, and conserve them. But we shouldn't look at degraded, we shouldn't label these, these, these logged forests as somehow degraded and ruined and of lesser attention. And if we're trying to think about conserving biodiversity at scale, we can't just think about the remaining well-protected ecosystems. We have to think about the wider matrix of human disturbed, human occupied ecosystems and the vibrant ecological functions that they can still, still provide. And that, that was a case of logging, but I think the examples that I just gave there with logging also apply to many other types of human modified ecosystems. So whether it's smallholder farmers in, in, in a forest uh, or other relatively low intensity disturbance. So we're not talking about conversion to industrial uh, agricultural systems with like plantations or cattle ranches, or, but smallholder human presence in forests in many ways doesn't necessarily degrade the ecological function of those forests. It often can enhance them. And there's increasing literature showing, showing many cases of human interaction with forests, often long-standing interaction, actually enhancing many ecological functions. So we need to get away from this perception that people and ecosystems are always bad news in terms of biodiversity and ecological function. There often can be ways of flourishing uh, for both people and, and ecosystems. Uh, is this finding generalizable across the tropics? I would say it's too soon to, to say. I, I, I suspect it is. Uh, but the Borneo case may be an exceptional example in terms of the magnitude of this effect because diptocarps are the main timber trees that are taken out, but are particularly inedible. They have unpalatable leaves that are rich in terpenes, and they're not very, not many things can eat diptocarp leaves. But I think the same principles are likely to apply elsewhere in the tropics. And so we're hoping to replicate these studies in a, in a range of other tropical forests and other ecosystems in, in years to come. And just to conclude, uh, I always end, end my, many of my student lectures on changes in the tropics with this diagram, which uh, I think is a reason why, well, I think what keeps me going in terms of thinking about what, what, what's going on in the tropics or any other biome. And on the left, we have our ecosystems of the past, these rich biologically diverse ecosystems. And those ecosystems, are under intense pressure for many reasons, but the two main uh, reasons here, these two red belts are pressures to do with land use and forest use associated drivers that are constricting those, those systems. And the other sets of pressures are more planetary, climate change and atmospheric change. And so these, these ecosystems are being constricted. Now, I think there's every reason to, to believe that this isn't a one way, this constriction isn't a one way funnel to doom that actually we're going through a particular intensity of macro pressures in the early 21st century. And those pressures may well ease, I hope they will ease by the middle to late century uh, as, as we reach eventually a stable climate uh, through agreement. And also as the economic transitions that occur in forests move from deep, further conversion to restoration and recovery, as we've already seen in North America and increasingly in Europe. 
as marginal agricultural lands are, are abandoned. But how tight these restrictions are will determine whether the ecosystems that come out the other end are rich and flourishing. They'll all be different. There's no way we can go back to the ecosystems of the past. Climate change, invasive species, all these factors mean that the ecosystems of the 200 years ago, 300 years ago are gone. There's no coming back to those. But they can still be functional and vibrant and diverse ecosystems, or they can be greatly diminished ecosystems. And how wide we can keep this bottleneck open is a big, in these decades, uh, uh, well, is a big factor in determining what will come through as we move towards the middle and later part of this century. And I think understanding and going beyond the pristine ecosystems to these novel ecosystems, these human modified ecosystems is a key part of this puzzle of how do we get from, from the bottleneck to beyond the bottleneck. And so I'd, uh, thank, uh, I'd like to thank various colleagues that have contributed uh, my, from a team and in, both in Oxford and internationally and, and our, our funders. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yadvinda. That was a uh, really outstanding talk. Thank you and very, very thought prov provoking. Um, I found your last slide particularly um, interesting and um, quite thought prov provoking. Um, so we have some questions um, from from the audience and lots of enthusiastic comments as well. Um, <clears throat> The first question um, says, marvelous variety of field methods. How confident are you about the accuracy of your productivity measurements? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, we're fairly confident over time. Uh, 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 over time, what we've done is compare these methods with sometimes other independent methods where we measure the direct flow of carbon dioxide in and out of a forest uh, by, by, by placing sensors above the forest. And wherever we've done these comparisons, uh, broadly, uh, we find quite good agreement and consistency. Uh, I won't say they're perfect, they were, but one, one other thing of this is that we put a lot of effort into quantifying the uncertainty in each measurement and therefore propagating that uncertainty through in our calculations. And, uh, and, and, and that, I think that's a very useful tool to do because uh, it's very easy in any one of these measurements to dwell and get hung up on, on the difficulty and the uncertainty. So when you're measuring roots in the soil, it's it's laced with uncertainty, the disturbances you do when you do those measurements, all those things. Uh, but rather than get dysfunctionally uh, uh, blocked by those challenges, you just put a ballpark uncertainty on that and say, well, actually, we don't know the roots to within 30%, for example, uh, uh, and propagate that through in your calculations. And ultimately, we come up with a reasonable estimate of the overall uncertainty uh, that, that, that compares well with other, other measurements. Thank you. Um, and uh, the second question, are tropical forests or even nearly all forests becoming net emitters of GHGs as a result of global heating? And what does that mean for climate change mitigation strategies? That's another great question. Uh, uh, so the, the broad context of this is that uh, 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 disturbance in forests obviously causes a release of carbon. Old growth forests, you would think that they were carbon neutral. So the classic ecological paradigm is that a mature forest is in balance, that individual trees are absorbing carbon, but other trees are dying and decomposing and releasing carbon. What we found in our observations is that that is not the case, that many old growth forests seem to be carbon sinks, absorbing carbon. And we think this is a response to the uh, rising CO2 in the atmosphere, stimulating the photosynthesis and creating this carbon sink that roughly accounts, absorbs around 15% of our anthropogenic fossil fuel and green uh, emissions. So they're significant. That sink, the, the, the question the, the question that is asking is, is that sink turning into a source? We're seeing evidence of that sink weakening. In the Amazon in particular, it's decreased by about half in the last uh, a decade or two decades. But broadly for the Amazon as a whole, it hasn't yet turned into a carbon source, at least in the intact forest. Uh, in the Congo, there's no evidence yet of that sink weakening. The Congo forest is a little bit cooler, a slightly higher elevation, and that may be a reason there. But the Amazon with repeated droughts does, does, does seem to be weakening. There is a there, ha, there was a lot of media coverage 
which I think confused the issue, talking about the Amazon becoming a source. And what that was doing was mixing this weakening sink with all the deforestation that we know is a source. Mm. And when you combine the two, yes, the Amazon is a source, but the non-deforesting, degrading areas of the Amazon mm. are still carb carbon sink. So sometimes there's a confusion about that. But the, the overall aim of the question is pivotal. If this carbon sink in the forests does turn into a carbon source in the decades to come, then that could be a definition of dangerous climate states with mm. sense where, where the biosphere stops being a break on climate change, a modest break by, by absorbing some of our carbon and turns into an accelerator by, by starting to release carbon to the atmosphere. Then, then whatever we do, we start losing control of the, of, of the, of the biosphere overall. Mm. So it's, it's a very concerning question to, uh, to identify whether the, the, this tipping point could occur. And that would be a very solid definition of what a dangerous threshold for climate change would be. Mm. Thank you, yeah, Binda. And the next question, what are the major trends you have seen in your career? For example, we have got used to the idea that biodiversity is under threat, but perhaps you have seen counter trends. So that sort of builds in with your last question and answer. Uh, I wouldn't deny that biodiversity is under threat. And I think the biggest, currently the biggest source of decline of biodiversity is the conversion of tropical rainforests into agriculture. Uh, 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 but not the, the small scale agriculture that I showed in my last slides, but turning them into cattle ranches or mm. soybean plantations or, or oil plant plantations. There's undoubtedly major loss of biodiversity in, the, in that conversion. Uh, uh, and, and I think as, as, uh, as we go into the century, climate change, up to today, climate change has probably not been a major cause of biodiversity loss but it certainly is an increasing and looming threat as, as the climate becomes warmer. Uh, what my slide, my work, but the work I was showing was not trying to argue against that, but also arguing perhaps a little bit about looking beyond purely numbers of species to looking at ecological functioning and vibrancy of ecosystems. And maybe in some cases, we have to be a bit broader our de definitions are looking at ecological functions accepting in many cases non-native species and the ecological functions that they provide uh, in this broader sense of biodiversity uh, that isn't just focused on individual, on the number of species, which is, which is hugely valuable. I'm not discounting the value of individual species that are unique to an area, but in terms of ecological function, I think perhaps we need to have a, a broader approach to thinking about biodiversity. Thank you. Um... And the next question, we're, they're, they're coming in um, more and more now, so I hope we can get through them all. Um, very, it starts off with very good lecture. Um, are there data on how the fungal communities change with ecosystem disturbance and degradation? Uh, not much is the answer in the case of the tropics. There certainly are data on that in, in temperate forests and temperate ecosystems. Uh, how they change uh, in tropics is, is very little studied, but, but perhaps it's not something I'm particularly focused on. So there may be other experts uh, elsewhere that, that can add more, more, more detailed uh, to, uh, to information on that. Uh, and, and in fact, my colleague Jesus, who may I think he may well be in the audience here, uh, I showed us some of his slides. He's particularly looking at fungal community data from 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 the whole network of sites that we have. Look at evidence or what factors are shaping. Uh, shaping the, the, the fungal communities in their systems. But I don't have an easy answer to, in terms of how they change in response to the, these disturbances. And, and perhaps the next question can, can sort of segue into um, what you were just saying there, um, Yad Vinda. It's, it's asking how does white and wood fit into your story? So presumably there can be a bit more underground exploration of the mycorrhizas and fungal um uh, the 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 um uh, interactions there yeah yeah yes absolutely uh, i think white and it's fantastic it's intrinsically a fascinating study system in itself uh, there's lots we can learn we keep on learning at, at white uh and i some of my my team and others are, are doing more and more work on on below ground communities mm. we're doing some work also characterizing the below ground faunal community as well, the mesofauna and, uh, as well as the, the, 
the, the fungal community. So hopefully in a year or two's time, we could say more about, about the Whiteham mm. community. And more generally, I, I find Whiteham is still a complex and rich system, but it is a simpler system than a tropical mm. forest. And that is, so I find it a very good place to try out ideas, uh, try out people as well. So send a student out there for a summer and see how they cope before you send them yes. to the Amazon uh, as well. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a really amazing resource we have both ecologically, but also in terms of trying out ideas before we take them further. Yeah, it is a treasure of Oxford, Whiteham. And then the last question, um, it says, Rainforest Saver are working with agroforestry in the Amazon and Cameroon using uh, Inga edulis. We are having fantastic results, but urgently need more science. Any recommendations how to fund more studies? Uh, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I I think uh, those sort of questions that uh, I think I'm not, I'm not sure who the questioner is, but I think linking up with universities there's often uh, either a, initially as a student project there are always ways of looking at these questions of, and you know, if there's a real really powerful science questions there, working with partners to get ac academic research grants uh, can, can be a way of doing that. Not just academic grants; they often can be developmental, or if this is for restoring rainforests. I think there's potential around carbon money and carbon finance often to, to to look at look at look at some of the research questions around these as well. And maybe the person that answered that that, that asked that question could get in touch with you, um, mm -hmm. maybe to to get some suggestions. Yeah, Advinda, that would be be great. So um, thank you again, Yadvinda, and a big um, um, online round of applause from everybody in the audience i'm sure who who we can't see or hear but um that was a great way to conclude our um autumn lectures and there's there's a lovely comment that came in very early on um from um someone um a student in azerbaijan called Igun, who's who's tuned into all these lectures and He's saying how much he's enjoyed them and um, particularly your your talk this evening. So he was the person, I think, who asked the first question in our first lecture of the of the series given by Rob. And he's followed them all through and he said how much he enjoyed them and wanted that known to you, especially tonight. Yeah, okay. so that's a lovely, and it 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 also illustrates the point that that by doing these lectures online, we're engaging with audiences across the world, um, rather than just here in Oxford. So that's that that that's a great note to to end on. So I'd like to thank you, um, Yadvinda, for giving a, a wonderful um, ending to our, our our series, and thank all the. The lecturers and and also thank everyone else for tuning in and also to remind you um that we have another series of of lectures starting in uh january these are these are slightly more general they're not scientific necessarily um and many of them have a fo focus on horticulture and garden design and um and and plants of interest and and all sorts of things in the in the plant world. So I'd encourage you to look at our website and also um, look at what we've got on offer and, and, and subscribe. These are going to be um, in-person lectures and they'll be taking place not in the Maths Institute where we did our last ones, but in the um, University of Oxford Museum of Natural History. And one final thing, if you've um, enjoyed the lectures and have any feedback, if you haven't enjoyed the lectures even and you want to put some feedback, please use the uh, QR code and give us feedback, which is always welcome um, to develop this series of lectures and indeed all our lectures um, that we, 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 we put on via the Botanic Garden and Arboretum. So, 
Um, on that note, I wish you all good evening and say goodbye from myself um, and Yad Vinda and wish you all a very, a very happy Christmas and see you all in the new, new year. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.